This is me racing out of bed for a front row seat to my life's work vanishing before my eyes. Linus Tech Tips, deleted, OMG 50 tech linked, can't believe toasted, we have been tech pals at long. Glad the good to see news you doping, is you that if you're watching this, you're error. back online. The bad news is that Success. this kind of attack has become so commonplace on YouTube that when we sat down to prepare this video, it took us less than 10 seconds to find a huge channel that was dealing with exactly the same thing in that moment. Let's talk then about the motive for these attacks, the process changes that we and YouTube need to make, and how we can all work together as a community to educate <laughs> bro, and protect each other bro, from bad actors. I don't think anybody is anybody's doing any hacking. I think, I think this is all um, social engineering. These days, hacking is pretty much impossible across the board. There's only a couple things we can still hack. It's still just social engineering. Oh, but I'll see and though. to tell you about our sponsor, Dbrand. Oh God, not Dbrand. Today, really? Oh, actually no, they've got something good. Stay tuned. How's that not true? Bro, you don't know shit, just stop. The fireworks started a little after three in the morning when the Linus Tech Tips account was renamed to Tesla and started streaming a podcast style recording of self-proclaimed techno king Elon Musk discussing cryptocurrency. This in and of itself is not a scam, Whoa. but the streams linked to a scam website that claimed that for every one bit- okay. This guy says, I work in InfoSec, you are more right than wrong. Bing. Bro, listen, listen. In the general chat, when you think about hacking overall, you're thinking like brute forcing and shit like that. Okay, that's like old school type shit. Bitcoin, you There's only a few hacking methods that are still around to this day. It, people mostly will do social engineering and they're just gonna get like low level employees with a bunch of fucking. Um, Fucking pen testing bullshit tactics and shit, and they just they just get what they want out of them. That's all. They just talk like level one reps at most bullshit, and they just they just they troll. You sent, they would return double, complete with fake transaction records showing other users definitely getting huge payouts. Over the next couple of hours, then we sparred back and forth. First, I privated the streams, revoked the channel stream key, and attempted to reset the account credentials, only to realize, as I was investigating the source of the breach that I had been completely outmaneuvered. They were back in and the streams were live again. How the, okay, so I log back in, nuke the stream again, and I go to, and they're up again. And now videos are being mass deleted from the channel. <sighs> Over the next couple of hours playing login whack-a-mole. Bro, is this, is this butt ass naked though? Linus Tech Tips, Tech Linked, and Tech Quickie accounts were each used to host these Elon Musk crypto streams until they were ultimately nuked by YouTube altogether for violating YouTube's terms of service. And I can almost feel your thoughts through the screen right now. Linus, truly, after all these lectures about two-factor authentication, don't you even protect your own accounts? Of course I do. But while strong passwords and multi-factor authentication are very powerful security measures that you should use, they're not impenetrable. First up, let's talk 2FA. Not all- Nah, let's talk 3FA. Also, people think 2FA is good. If, if, 2FA, if you're using 2FA and they're both virtual type shit, it's still bad. You need to use 2FA, but you use a, a physical second FA or 3FA with a physical one. Physical FA, still juicer. That's, that's the real thing. 5FA doesn't exist. For is this, why there's only three concepts in these security systems. Something that you know, something that you are, something that you have. Something that you know, a password. Something that you are, your eyes, your fingertips. Something that you have, months, pog, pog, a pog, physical key. QCL. All factors or additional authentication elements are equally secure. The most common second factor, SMS, can be compromised by simple social engineering targeted at your phone carrier. Check out this video that we posted the last time our account was hijacked for more information about that. Oh my god. Another common Did factor, he just say what I said earlier? Notification based multi factor is susceptible to fatigue attacks, where a perpetrator will constantly try to log in, hoping that you'll assume 
oh, it's probably someone from work, or even just click on the notification by accident. It's very problematic. And I'm looking at you, Google, since you can't disable this factor on Google accounts. Even time-based two-factor, like Google Authenticator or Authy, can be compromised, say if you were to accidentally set it up or access it from an infected device. In spite of all of these issues with two-factor though, it held the line last night. Our attacker not only never gained access to our additional authentication factors, they never even had our passwords. <laughs> but how can that be? I mean... Well, as it turns out, they didn't need any of that. Nope. Which is a big part of why it took me so long to clue in and stop the spread. I was so focused on the potential damage that could be done by someone who had commandeered my SMS messages or gained access to my Google Authenticator somehow that I expended valuable time battening down the wrong hatches. If I had watched Theo Joe's recent video on the subject, or at least skimmed the comments, I could have probably stopped the bleeding in a matter of minutes. Shout out Theo Joe. But I didn't, so I got to be educated the hard way about a breed of attacks that bypass trivial things like passwords and 2FA entirely by targeting what's known as a session token. Oh now, shit! Many people might just solve that easy. And if you do, give yourself a cookie. But after you log into a website and your credentials have been validated, that site will provide your web browser with a session token. This allows your browser, and by extension you, to stay logged in when you restart your browser and go to access that site. And they again. export it or they clone it? This isn't a bad thing. It's a good thing because realistically, nobody wants to type in a password every time they want to post instant regret on the internet. But hold on a second. That cookie is stored locally on your device. How would someone else get it? Yeah, they fucking well, yoink. That's where we made a mistake. Someone on our team, and I'm not saying it was Colton, downloaded what appeared to be a sponsorship offer from a potential partner. <laughs> it was an innocent enough mistake for the most part. The email came from a legitimate looking source and it didn't raise any immediate red flags like being full of grammatical errors. So they extracted the contents, launched what appeared to be a PDF containing the terms of the deal, then presumably when it didn't work, went about the rest of their day. What happened in the background took place over the course of just 30 seconds. The malware accessed all user data from both of their install- Well, technically, it's still social engineering because you're, you're making a human do a dumb fucking thing. Okay, that is still, that is still count as, so you're, you're, you're enticing a dumb fuck to, to read something and be manipulated into clicking a link. It's still as SC. Chrome and Edge, including everything from locally saved passwords to cookies to browser preferences, giving them effectively an exact copy of those browsers on the target machine that they could export, including, that's right, session tokens for every logged in website. Now, no one should unzip an email attachment. File extensions should always be double checked when you're executing anything, and any file that doesn't do what you expect should raise immediate red flags. But then, on the flip you side- You can also open files like this, I'm pretty sure in, in, a, in, in a box, right? Like in a, in, a, in a virtual machine, and bust that bitch. I'd, I can hardly blame a sales rep or a video editor- A sandbox. Or someone in accounting for not being up on the latest in cybercrime, and I also believe that in a healthy organization, actually rolls up the hill rather than down. So there's not gonna be any disciplinary actions because the simple truth is that if we had more rigorous training for our newcomers and better processes for following up notifications from our site-wide anti-malware, this could have been easily avoided. As for why it took so long for us to lock down the account once we knew what was going on, that's another training issue, but this time it was my training. We use a system for our YouTube channels called Content Manager, which theoretically improves security by allowing us to dole out specific channel access roles to our various team members, That's, rather yeah. than just sharing the main account credentials with everyone who needs to access it. This made oh, the process no. of determining Line the attack vector way more complicated. You can think of it kind of like replacing your one giant vault door with 20 smaller doors, any one of which realistically still Chat, what if you gave admin the five accounts that gave uh, um, upload rights to like fucking 50 accounts each and you had a list of fucking a billion other e emails or whatever that could, people could upload them? Gets you into the vault. 
Now, in a perfect world, these it smaller doors should have been restricted with less access than we configured, but hindsight is 2020, or at least I hope it is. The bottom line is that our disaster response processes need to improve because I realized at three Night whatever bombs. in the morning, shout out Steve from Gamers Nexus for the wake up call, by the way, that I actually didn't know how to reset the passwords and the access control across all of these channels in Channel Manager. And that is not the sort of thing that you want to be troubleshooting butt naked in the wee hours of the morning but in the middle of the crisis. But why is he naked? In fairness to me, the way that Google handles the intermingling of all their services is not the most intuitive, and both Yvonne and I experienced numerous glitches and timeouts that prevented us from effectively using I these tools fully even then. once we did figure out how to use them. Which leads us nicely then into the next part of our discussion. I've owned what I did wrong. Fully gloated. It's time to talk full, about Full, full. Yep, not kidding. To their credit, I heard back full, that someone full. was aware and working on it at the highest levels within about half an hour of reaching out to my YouTube rep. And they have seemingly improved their internal tools for managing this sort of thing a lot since the last time around. They've got forms you can fill out, and the partner reps that we've worked with seem to genuinely care. Shout out MC, I'm so sorry this spoiled your spa day. <laughs> However, this entire process has been pretty opaque. Other than we're aware and working on it, the internal team doesn't seem to even be allowed to communicate with creators directly. I mean, I get it. Security aside, idiot users probably won't have anything to contribute to their investigation. They figured out that the attack came from one of our non-video production teams pretty quickly and then actually banned that Google Workspace account almost immediately. I mean, realistically, idiot users could just slow them down. But even a quick, hey, I know you're stressed, uh, here's what's going on, and here's how we can keep this from spreading, would almost certainly have calmed my nerves and saved all of us some work by keeping TechLinked and TechQuickie in our hands. And another big problem is that this approach, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, only benefits larger channels like ours. I've seen quite a few people, rightly, express some resentment that we were able to get this resolved so quickly when their favorite niche creator X or Y struggled with it for an extended period of time or even never got it fully resolved. So it's clear that there are some changes that need to be made, and here are a few of them in no particular order. We need greater security options for key channel attributes. I mean, how can you change the name yeah, the person of who, you? The person who had hacked my Twitter um, didn't even, they, uh, apparently they, they couldn't see my DMs because all they had is a, um, they just had an interface that they could use apparently. All they have is like, um, like an employee interface type shit. That's it. That's why they were able to tweet from my account, but they weren't able to see my DMs or DM anybody. Name of a channel without having to yep. re-enter your password and your two-factor. What about resetting a stream some, uh, some admin Same tool deal, in my opinion. And this is just one of the fun. ways that Go the impact again of a session hijacking can be limited. Rate limiting is also widely used in API access to services like YouTube. For example, Google will only process a certain number of comment moderation actions per day through their API. Well, I could see implementing something similar, even if you are directly accessing the service, but then rather than limit it outright, it could prompt for authentication. To be clear, I'm not saying every time you delete a video, it should ask for your password, but no say if you were trying to delete 10. Oh, okay, I get it now. All right. I get it, Linus. I get it. I get it. You were hacked butt naked. Embarrassing. I can't feel bad though. That, uh, getting hanged is fucking cooked up. XQCL. Glad to get channel back, sir. Yo, this is X. X on yeah. the beat, yo. Okay. Oh, my voice as well. That S. Anyone knows that boy? I don't know, he's just so soy. Anyone knows that boy? I don't know, he's just so soy.